Welcome to Clued in Mystery. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brooke. And we both love mystery. Good morning, Brooke. How are you today? I'm great, Sarah. And I'm very excited to be talking to you about historical mystery. Yeah, I'm really excited about this today because it's a topic that is near and dear to me. Um, it's probably one of my favorite subgenres of, of mystery, and I, I almost always have a uh, historical mystery on the go, whether I'm listening to one or reading one. So I'll just start with uh, an overview. Historical mystery in Western writing is relatively new, uh, really only gaining popularity from about the late 1970s. Uh, but I wanted to look a little bit more broadly at historical fiction, uh, where there are some earlier examples. So, um, you know, Shakespeare, for example, wrote historical fiction plays, Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar. They were set well before the time period that Shakespeare was living in. And that's one of the criterion for historical fiction, that it's uh, set at least 50 years before it's written. And that's true for historical mystery as well. Uh, moving forward a little bit, Leo Tolstoy, Sir Walter Scott, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote uh, historical fiction, and they set readers' expectations with respect to uh, keeping a focus on capturing the essence of the time through character clothing, their mannerisms, and the setting. So readers won't accept an automobile if the story is set in Regency England, unless it was an alternate history or historical fantasy. Early examples of modern historical mystery novels include Agatha Christie's Death Comes as the End, which is set in Egypt in 2000 BC and published in 1944. If we jump ahead a little bit to 1977, we see the release of the first book in the popular Brother Cadfail series by Ellis Peters, and that was set in 12th century England. A year later, Anne Perry's first book, uh, The Cater Street Hangman, was published, and it's the first of her Thomas and Charlotte Pitt series, uh, which is set in Victorian London. Uh, and she carries that series on through their son um, uh, in a series that's set in Edwardian England, and then she's got another uh, set in early Victorian England as well. Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose is set in 14th century Italy and was published in Italian in 1980 and English in 1983. And I found several references to it as really spurring the popularity of the genre. And it, it sold over 50 million copies. In the last 40 years, several other authors have found success in historical mystery. And some that I've read and really enjoyed include Andrea Penrose's Wexford and Sloan series, which is set in Regency England, Iona Wishaw's Lane Winslow mysteries, which are set in the interior of British Columbia and take place following the Second World War. C.J. Sansom's Shard Lake series is set in Tudor England, and Tasha Alexander's Lady Emily series set in Victorian England. There's several series as well that are set in the 1920s or during uh, or after the First or Second World Wars. And of course, there's many standalone books. So really, any um, and any period of history, I think there's, you know, uh, a reader is sure to find a historical mystery set then. So I could go on, but I'm just going to close this really brief overview by saying that there are some examples of historical mystery from outside Western literature. Uh, the short story collection, 1001 Nights, contains a story called The Three Apples, which is considered a mystery. And there's something called Gongan stories from China. And these feature Judge Di and Judge Bao Jing, both of whom were real people. And I've only read uh, one story featuring Judge Bao, uh, and it was presented more as a fable. And I just started listening to um, a translation of a Judge Di story and... and uh, I can certainly see the parallels to uh, you know, what we consider modern uh, mysteries in terms of you know, going to visit the crime scene and, and looking for clues. So, Brooke, I don't know if you feel the same way, but historical mystery doesn't seem as flashy to me as some of the other mystery categories like domestic thriller or spy fiction. You know, I don't think that the book of the summer is uh, going to be a historical mystery. But I keep returning to this genre because of the focus on solving the crime and the joy of being lost in another time. Uh, and I know you read historical fiction. Do you find the same thing? Yeah, definitely. I, I hadn't thought of that, but you're exactly right. It's not as flashy. It, it maybe seems a little bit more quiet and intellectual. But, um, but yeah, I find the same thrill. And the other thing that I think is so fun about historical mystery is you are going to not have the technology 
because even if it's just 50 years ago from now, <laughs> you know, we're not going to have computers and um, cell phones and that stuff that's ready at your fingertips. And so it harkens back to the more traditional golden age mystery, I think, because the sleuth and their sidekicks have to be reliant on the clues and the evidence at hand. So I think that that's very um, endearing to me. And then I just love, like you said, to be put into another time period. And I love to learn the little tidbits that the author gives us and sort of educates us on that era, even if it's just a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot, but I just love that. I agree. That's one of the things that I that I really enjoy. And I've never formally studied history. Uh, so, you know, I didn't take any university courses that were that were in history, but um, I have gone on to read nonfiction or read a little bit more about a historical period or a particular event after reading it in in a mystery, right, in a, in a historical mystery. It has encouraged me to learn more about things. Oh, I do the same thing. Like a lot of times I'll be reading, let's say it's, I, I like a lot of Victorian England settings. And if then I like have a little search going on for podcasts that are about the, you know, the true events of that era. And and then I'll find a documentary that I want to watch. It just sort of opens up a whole um, rabbit hole of, of research. And that's just, it's really fun. Um, so that makes me wonder, Sarah, how important is it to you that everything be really historical, historically accurate? It actually isn't that important to me. I know some people feel it's very, very critical that everything be as historically historically accurate as possible. And so, you know, I I write in historical mystery and um I try, you know, not to incorporate things that I know didn't exist when when the characters were um were were living, right? Mm-hmm. So like I said in the introduction, um, you know, there's no um no cars because in Vancouver we didn't have them until um, a few years after after my stories are set. But I, I, it's almost it's almost fun to figure out if something was historically accurate or not. I love reading the author's notes at the end of historical fiction books because they'll often talk about okay this is this is what actually happened. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you know, if you want uh, more information, here are some resources to look at, uh, and here's where I I fudged things a little bit. So you know, I, I think there's you know, as an author, you're you, you have some creative license to create a character, to create an event, to you know maybe push something up uh, a little earlier than it originally happened because it fits the story. I I don't have any problem with that, but I think there's there's probably some people who yeah. who feel very strongly otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. In preparing for our episode, I listened to a really great interview, a podcast interview with Deanna Rayborn, who um, of course writes the Lady Julia Gray mystery series and the Veronica Speedwell. And she was saying that somewhere along the line, she got the recommendation to, as she's doing her research, decide that 70% of it is just for her and 30% of it can make it into the book. Um, so it just flavors the, the prose. Um, and she was saying, you know, if you really want to learn about an era or an event, then you should probably go get a nonfiction book because, you know, her stories, she was saying were meant for, um, for entertainment and their fiction and she's going to take some liberties and she's going to have some creative license. And so I think that that's true. You know, I was thinking about, I I don't write historical, but you're never going to read my books and get a lesson on the criminal justice system, you know, or the way a crime is 100% investigated because it's a cozy mystery and there's going to be some creative licenses taken. And I think we need to give that same grace to authors who write historical one of the things that I read to prepare for our conversation today was um, Agatha Christie's book, uh, her historical novel, Death Comes as the End. Uh, and so uh, there were a couple of things that I thought were really interesting. It's the only historical fiction that she wrote. Um, and it's also one of 
only four of her books that has never been adapted for screen. Uh, so, and I, I don't know why that is, you know, it, mm. I'm sure it would be, you know, considerably more expensive to uh, create a set that was um, ancient Egypt. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was definitely an Agatha Christie novel. There was, there were murders and, and um, uh, I wasn't entirely sure who the, who the, person behind it was, uh, but it did feel a little bit different to her other books. Um, and I, I do think it's interesting that that was the only historical fiction that she, that she wrote. And I tried to find kind of what the reception at the time was for it, but I imagine because it's the only one that she wrote, it didn't get, mm -hmm. it didn't sell enough that she wanted to continue to write you know, to, to continue to write historical mysteries. Yeah. She's definitely someone that probably would have continued if it had been successful. You know, she, she was very smart about her, her, um, career that way. Um, one thing you noted in there is something I really wanted to bring up because I think that a lot of readers get this wrong that, uh, and you said it at the opening, a historical mystery needs to be set in a time period historical from the author's era or perspective, not, you know, not historical from this point back. I, I listened to um, a show not too long ago and the host of it was recommending golden age mysteries as historical fiction. And it's like, no, that's not, that's not what that means. It needs to have been written by the author as a piece of historical fiction. Um, but to get back to to Agatha, that is a, that is one that I have not read, and um, and you're it sort of sticks out as an anomaly in her canon, I think, and and it almost like to me, I think that's why it it hasn't ever popped up as something that I have really been drawn to because it seems different. But it's good to know that it still feels like a Christie novel when you read it. I guess it's set in a in a family estate in, in Egypt. So, you know, kind of like a manor house, there's, you know, lots of, lots of characters and, and lots of deaths, but yeah, there was something, I don't know if I can articulate what it was that was, that was different. And I, I, to your earlier point, I was thinking about, you know, the difference between screen adaptations of, of her mysteries that we see today, which, you know, I, I can understand why the, the person on the, um, the podcast that mentioned uh, golden age mysteries as as historical mysteries, because you you could almost classify the screen versions that we're watching today as historical mysteries, even though when her stories were published, they weren't historical, right? They were they would have been modern um, uh, at the time. Um, but I wonder if some of the appeal of particularly her screen adaptations, um, apart from the mystery, is how they're so rooted in time. You know, we've talked before about how they may be pushed ahead or, or back a couple of years, those adaptations, but they're never um, uh, adapted in the way that Sherlock is, for example, set, you know, in present day, right? And so, I, you know, I don't know if, um, if it, that, mm -hmm. the way that they're rooted in time is, um, is part of the appeal of her stories. And then I was also wondering about um, the continuations of her stories where, you know, I'm thinking of Sophie Hanna, for example, would that be considered historical mystery? Mm. Oh, that's a conundrum. That's a really good question. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I guess technically it is because she's writing in that era in, you know, from our modern day. So mm, that's so interesting, Sarah. Yeah. And I actually also read an Egypt historical mystery to prepare for today. And it was um, Crocodile on the Sandbank, which is by Elizabeth Peters. Um, do you have a uh, favorite era, Sarah, of historical mystery? Oh, that's a really good question, Brooke. Ah, yeah, that's a really good question. So I I really like the Shard Lake series you set, um, you know, in Tudor England. So, because uh, I, I really like historical fiction from, from that period as well. Um, thinking of, uh, Philippa Gregory and, you know, all of the books that, that she wrote, I absolutely devoured those. Um, so it was fun to read the 
shard like mysteries and kind of maybe learn a little bit more about that that uh, period of time and and um you know think about think about mysteries then i i think that's probably my my favorite era and every now and again i think oh maybe that would be an era that i would write in or the other era that i think i would write in um even though i know virtually nothing about it so i'd have to do so much research would be um like medieval I also really like mysteries set in Victorian England. So um, like I mentioned, Tasha Alexander's Lady Emily series and uh, Anne Perry's Thomas and Charlotte Pitt series, which is uh, one of my favorite, um, favorite series. And it's very long. I think there's close to 30 books or maybe even more in that series. So, uh, you know, you can get really, really immersed in that. That sounds fantastic. And what about you, Brooke? Which is your favorite? Probably Victorian England is sort of my favorite go-to, but I wrote down the Shard Lake series because I also like devoured the Philippa Gregory series. Um, so I think that that sounds really good. I also loved the television series, the Tudors, like that, that era is also really fascinating to me. And I was going to say, I think you should jump in and do the medieval series, Sarah, because, you know, one thing, the farther back you get the less there is, right? There, the historical record is squishy as it is. So getting all the research just exactly right becomes less and less um, daunting um, than say writing about the 1920s, right? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think the further back you go, the more creative license you have. Um, and it would be, you know, a really good excuse to spend some time in, um, you know, some uh, European city that that has uh, a lot of history to do some research. <laughs> yeah, you'd need to go on a lot of castle tours, I think. Exactly. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe I'll work that into my plan. Uh, so, Brooke, I think this has been a really um, really interesting introduction to historical mystery, and I know we're going to dig more into it uh, in our next episode when Sarah Rosette joins us, which I'm really really looking forward to. Yes, I cannot wait. And I can't believe that Sarah Rosette is coming on the show to talk with us. It's just going to be so exciting. Thanks for joining us today on Clued in Mystery. I'm Brooke. And I'm Sarah. And we both love mystery. Clued in Mystery is produced by Brooke Peterson and Sarah M. Stephen. Music is by Shane Ivers at silvermansound.com. Visit us online at cluedinmystery.com or social media at Clued in Mystery. If you like what you heard, Please consider subscribing, leaving a review, or telling your friends.